Hey everyone, welcome to our photo reviews. Today we're gonna read Mighty Quill. And you know what? I got a fun drinking game to go along with this one. Since it seems to be a common trend in these books, I'm gonna i I'm gonna drink do a drinking game and have some fun. So every time the main characters think about or act on adult temptations, we're gonna take a sip. Let's see how it goes. It's gonna be a lot of fun, isn't it? One minute thirty seven seconds later. Today's book is The Mighty Quill by Emmeline Strange. The book was self-published on Amazon Kindle, at least so far as I was able to discern, and was released on April 8, 2002. 22. The book has no real interesting trivia, and to be completely honest with you, I didn't buy this book for myself. It was sent to me by a friend in March last year. So, that's about all the interesting trivia I got. I'm gonna take a break while get some water while we do this rating cards thing. Alright, so, small break aside, some aspirin taken, some water drawn. Let's go ahead and move on to the cover. Now, in initial impressions on this cover are great. It shows our two main characters, Cassie and Rode here, the one jumping in, and Thor Ambrose front and center on a parody of the famous, I should probably keep this up, on, the, on a parody of the famous Vitruvian Man art piece by Leonardo da Vinci. Cassian is kissing Thor, so you know this book's going to be gay and proud about it. And the painting is framed with little snippets from the book itself. You know, you got swans here, you got the hedgehog here, I keep, I keep putting, you got like a bloody handprint over here, you got a microscope, all hints of what happens in the book. All in all, it's a pretty decent cover on first impressions. There is one major issue with this book. You notice how I sort of danced around something very obvious on this cover. The fact that Thor is half shifted into a hedgehog on this cover. Now, like I said, on first glance, this is a very good cover as it lets it know the story is going to have fantastical elements to it, especially in an urban fantasy setting. And one of these characters is going to be not technically human. However, this is a really big however, this spoils one of the biggest spots of tension in the book. Thor, for most of the book, doesn't have the ability to shift into this creature. And it's led to believe that he's a genetic anomaly in his bloodline due to his inability to shift into an animal. This is the source of a lot of drama and tension on his side of the story. And this cover right here spoils outright that he will eventually learn to shift. You aren't going to read this book and become <gasps> when Thor finally does shift into a hedgehog for the first time. You'll just be annoyed that the surprise was stolen from you by the very thing meant to draw you into the book. Ah, but there'll be time enough for rants later. Instead, let's, let's get to what the story is about. Here's what's on the back of the book. Cassie and Rose is just a normal guy going through normal college stuff. Weird roommate? Check. Panic over grades? Check. Sexuality crisis? Uh, falling for your roommate? Hold on. Finding out your new BF's family is magic? Wait, what the? And that's the background. That, that's literally the synopsis on the back of the book. On the offset, that's a pretty decent synopsis. Short and sweet, it gets to the point, but it's brimming with personality and on the side. The book itself has a lot more going on in it, but it's just stuff for a quick fire. Thor and Cassian also discover that someone is apparently murdering shifters in some horrific way, but cannot found, find out how or why. While they can't put together the most easily solved mystery in the world set before them, we also see that Thor has a strained relationship with this family because they're all shifters, people who can turn into animal-based forms and embody tropes associated with that animal, and he's just a normal human as far as he knows. And that's really it because 
there's really no way I can succinctly just sum up this book in a way that's going to prepare you for my rant. And I'll be honest, I tried really, really hard to like and be kind to this book. It was a self-published work, and I understand it won't be as spick and span as someone going through the traditional editing process. It's going to be rough, and you're going to have things like weird formatting, a lot more typos, and stuff like that cropping up. And there were certainly elements of this book I really did appreciate. Despite things I'll say later, Thor and Ambrose do have a healthy communication going on in their relationship. And the author does well to avoid the trappings that a lot of romance authors fall into by having their characters simply not communicate, which does cause major problems. Cassian and Thor discuss their problems like mature adults and work past them in a healthy, in a healthy example of what a relationship should be. In addition, it's clear that the author has a lot of interesting ideas that she wants to put into, into the book. And the way the shifters are presented did make me eager to want to learn more about them. But this book has more than its fair share of problems. There's a lot of issues with the cropping and typos and other small technical errors, obviously. But I, I want to ignore the technical elements of this book for the time being and focus ent entirely on the story within the book. Because I honestly think the real meat and potatoes of why I had such issues with this book lie in that. Simply put, this book feels like the author is trying to speedrun an entire urban fantasy romance series in 450 pages or less. I I'm, I'm not kidding. This book feels like it's doing its best to do things that hit the, all the stereotypical romantic cliches everywhere, with the exception of the poor communication kills trope. Do they go through the phase where they're both clearly attracted to each other but refuse to admit it? Do they recover from a trauma merely through their love with each other as opposed to a mental health professional who proves completely inadequate for the situation? Meeting the parents and the hilarious awkwardness that comes with? Does one, of the, one side of the romance panic at the idea of the relationship upgrading past its current point almost leading to a breakup? Do they go to a masquerade ball? It's like Strange printed out a bullet point of all the romantic tropes she could think of and then started rushing through them so fast that she just get right to the point where they start nailing each other again. Which, serious question here. And I'm only asking this because I've noticed it as a very strong trend among the books I've read regarding this specific subject. What is it with female authors writing gay romances where the two leads do nothing but paw at each other like horny animals 99% of the time? This, this is, I mean this genuinely. Even books I really liked, like Red, White, and Royal Blue, even though Casey McQuiston is technically not binary but Alex and Henry at one point were just constantly humping. Brought to Light by Elliot Grayson and Not That Complicated by Isabel Murray were both entirely about the physical chemistry of the romance leads as well. And because of that, 90% of the romance was... <laughs> and now this book, where the book feels like it's just trying to speed run itself to the hokey pokey scenes. And it's specifically only with the gay romances. As female authors who write sapphic romances or female authors who write the hetero romances tend not to make the relationship entirely hinged on the sex that those characters have. In fact, I, I would actually go on a limb and say a lot of the sapphic romances have like one sex, one, one scene like that, spicy scene normally, and that, that's pretty much it. Most of the time it's them coming together and just emotionally connecting, and while the hetero romances kind of do the same thing. So I, I just, it's, it's just one of those, I'm, I'm curious. I, I mean, it's super noticeable when Thor in this book is S-aid and a lot of the focus on the after effects of the trauma that's caused to him is almost entirely on how his nightlife with Cassian is affected. Because you know, that's what I was worried about when I was reading the scenes where Thor was kidnapped. How will he ever escape and have sex with Cassian again? You guys do realize men do think about other things than getting their willy wet as much as common perception is against us there. 
But like I said, this entire book just sort of feels like an excuse for the author to write her gay erotic sex, her gay erotic scenes. Everything in between is hardly worth investing in. First of all, the pacing in this book is just atrocious. It's awful. One of the comments I made on Red, White, and Royal Blue was that the time conveyance is really bad in that book, as you could move forward in time a couple months between sentences. This book, much worse about that. I'm not kidding. There's a chap, there's one chapter in here where the it time skips about three or four times, and each time it's literally like, like you have one scene where Thor is staring at Ambrose lovingly, and then literally the next sentence is, and then I swipe my badge in at the security check-in. As it's the next day, and he went somewhere completely different. And, and at no point does the author just page break to show these, show these time skips. In fact, the only time where I think I could, the author did page break is when it was completely unnecessary. And the page break could have just been a new paragraph. Which, considering how this book is formatted, formatted, considering how this book is formatted, I'm not even sure this was an air the author intentionally made, as in, they were typing it and thought, oh, this is a page, this needs a page break. Or it was one that occurred because over the printing process of the book, like there was no page break here, but the printing process accidentally separated these two paragraphs. And I'll give Red, White, and Royal Blue this credit. At least the time jumps in there made some internal sense. While the book was very much sprinting out of nowhere and sucker punch you with a two weeks later. You can at least look back and realize, okay, it's been two weeks, and you know, you go back into the book and you add it up, yeah, okay, it makes sense that it's been two weeks, nothing internally contradicts this. This book, if you try to add up the time, it doesn't make any sense. For example, there's a moment in this book where, after Cassian has a freak out at Thor's family basically trying to drop kid and marriage conversations on him, after dating Thor for only about a week or two, during basically what amounts to Thanksgiving dinner, and then the two basically agree to, you know, do, try to do more conventional dating for a bit after discussing it, instead of just having their constant glam-to-glam -glam combat all the time. This leads to, which by the way only lasts all of one chapter, but just to put in perspective, there's a time skip in that section that's Thor, that says Thor dates Cassian for several weeks like this. Except they, they go to Cassian's family house for Christmas and arrive two days before Christmas starts. Now, let's do a little math here. You psychopaths? I don't even know which dog that was. Was that you or was that you? <laughs> I have that on video, by the way. Anyways, where was I? Now, Thanksgiving is celebrated the fourth Thursday of, of November, correct? Which means that absolute, the absolute earliest that it can take place is the 28th of November. Now, there's a lot of debate in whether several or a few, well, they actually stand on the time scale. But for me, if a couple is two, then a few has to be somewhere between three and four. Which means that several has to be beyond that. Now, let's be really generous and say the author is using several to mean four weeks, though. So that's another 28 days. And mind you, Thor and Cassian don't actually have this conversation about dating until about two days after Thanksgiving. So technically, this conversation would have taken place on the 30th when they started dating. But let's, let, let's assume they have the conversation literally seconds after we walked out of the house. So from the 28th of November, at 28 days, that's the 26th of December, past Christmas Day. And this isn't the only instance of this kind of time scale. Are you guys just going to be fighting in the background of my videos all the time now? And this isn't to mention that the author just conveniently decides to skip over stuff that she either felt like would take away from a two gay boys having midnight wrestling matches for too long, or just le legitimately couldn't think of how to resolve that particular plot point 
So she just skips past the point when it's resolved and doesn't explain it. For example, when Thor is kidnapped and no one knows where he is. You're asking questions during this time with how will they find him? Will he escape? What does this person want? Well, it doesn't matter because Thor escapes the guy's clutches off screen and we're never told how. Oh, and in the final act, there's the time Thor decides to lock Cassian in the cage to prevent him from being hurt by the big bad guy at the end, despite Cassian being both bigger and stronger than him and part of a very physical sport in hockey and is the kind of person who isn't afraid of getting into a fist fight whereas Thor is. Anyways, and then moves on. Well, guess what? In the final hour, Strange decides she did want Cassian in that final battle after all. And she wants him to suffer a near-fatal wound for some last-minute suspense. You know that romance trope with lovers sitting by the bedside or the other lovers in medically induced coma, only to come out during a tear-felt moment to provide comfort trope? So, the question remains. How does he escape that room? Good question. Seriously. This question is asked by Thor himself in the book, and the answer is never provided. How the fuck did Cassian escape this room? And better yet, why did he just randomly find a- why did he just randomly put on a gas mask he found and just- Like, he just saw a gas mask and was like, Yes. Also, where did he get the knife? He, he comes in with a knife! Where did he get it? Well, let's move on to other elements. Like, the urban fantasy nature. Now, shifters and their faunas are an interesting enough concept. Personally, I think I would equate them a lot like the Vesson from Grimm. A group of people who look human, but are actually otherworldly creatures that can take on animal-like forms. Most of the time. You know, there's also the trolls and stuff. And while the role is reversed in this story, whereas Grimm are technically the animal-like creatures taking human forms, where shifters are more humans taking animal forms, is still very accurate. That's, that's the main difference, though, honestly. The world itself has a lot of confusion addressing them, though. Okay, so first off, one of the common complaints against urban fantasy that I just cannot stand is the comment, why is the supernatural hiding from the common person? Most of the time, this complaint is leveled against the genre as a whole for as a reason this person can't stand the genre and act like it's a thing that's never addressed within the story. Except that it is commonly answered within the stories, or the story assumes you're smart enough to infer with the evidence they give you to why the supernatural is hiding. Oftentimes this tends to be because although the supernatural are individually strong, humans as a whole are a lot stronger, and if the full weight of humanity is ever brought down on a supernatural creature, it's going to die easily. Now, I brought up Grimm for a reason. Vesson are numerous, and as a whole, they tend to be more physically powerful than humans. Except they live in hiding. Now, why is that? Well, that's because not only are there Grimm, a group of natural monster hunters who, by the standard, tend to kill Vesson when they're given a chance, humans also don't tend to react well to the Vesson. And just because they are powerful supernatural creatures doesn't mean that they're invincible as the average bullet can pretty much end most Vessens' lives with ease. This isn't gonna get any better unless you stop. So with that, you don't need to be explicitly told this is why they're hiding. You understand why they hide themselves within human society. The more humans that know where they are, the greater of a chance a Grim is gonna find them or a human will kill them. As such, there's genuine ramifications when a Vessen reveals themselves to a human. Even Twilight of all series got that. And it falls hard into the whole supernatural is so much stronger than humans that they really don't have to hide because they don't have any real weaknesses. Vampires don't reveal themselves to humans because they have because the Volteri in the book enforces the rules that humans can't know about a vampire's existence or that human will be killed. You can at least infer you can also at least infer that while Edward believes he can snap the neck of an entire classroom of teenagers in about five seconds flat, the vampires probably still are going to be powerless against something like an M1 Abrams tank. But this book? I don't know why or even how it's been a secret. No one in this book treats it like it's a secret they have to keep. L Leda, Leda, I think it's Leda, 
Thor's friend just casually reveals her swan form to Cassian to shut him up during a scene, and then does it again when she starts dating Cassian's lesbian friend Lucy, just to make sure she'd be alright with her, you know, doing it with a swan. And no, don't ask me why all of them have mythological names, it's never explained. Thor is named Thor, you know, he has a brother named Ares, and you know, you would think that's a dad thing because he wants his sons to be big and powerful, so he's naming them after war gods, but then his wife is named Freya, and then you have Leda, who's the who's the mother of Castor in Roman mythology, which is also brought up in this book, so. Give it to me. Give me Elmo's face. I bought him an Elmo toy, and they tore his face off. By the way, this is the last haunted look of an Elmo of all his vicious death. And then there's Thor's family who doesn't even try to hide their shifter powers from Cassian when he visits for Thanksgiving, despite the fact that they have no reason to assume Cassian would have even known about any of this. I mean, the dad literally strolls out of the forest as a wolf holding a turkey in his mouth and then turns into a man. And then there's also Thor just casually telling a police detective about shifters when the man sort of implies he knows something paranormal is going on with this, you know, murdered shifter case. If there were no consequences to people knowing about the supernatural, then why don't people know? Speaking of Twilight, this book also experiments with a version of imprinting. But thankfully, in this case, the book doesn't try to make grooming seem like a beautiful act as part of a Native American culture. But it does work basically the same way as an Ice Planet Barbarians. Which means that it has the same exact problem that I had with it in Ice Planet Barbarians as well. The removal of agency in the romance. By having this mating pool, which is what it's called in this book, you make it less like the two characters fall in love, and more that there's an outside factor which forces one of these characters to advance in the romance without their own volition. They aren't that attracted to this person. Their mating pool is. Which is, again, explicitly stated as a way, as a instinctual way for them to help find mates. You can help them procreate better. Which also kind of makes me wonder why it works on gay people. Because Lita kind of mating pulls towards... Lucy and then Cassie and then you know Thor mating pulls towards Cassian and then there's also this element of it that the alpha in the relationship so basically the dom of the relationship has to bite if they're if they're a shifter has to bite the other partner and that basically marks them as the sub and it's not shifter exclusive because later this is explicitly spelled out for us by the way because Lita is the sub in the relationship between her and Lucy. Anyways. Uh, but even without this, the characters have a really hard time standing on their own. So I guess I get why they introduced the mating pool. Because without it, why the hell are these characters so attracted to each other? A lot of the stuff that the characters do mean nothing to them. Cassian is a man who loves cooking and is from a poor family. He's in a college trying to become a lawyer because that's a high paying job he can get to take care of his family. And he's also on the college hockey team. Except none of this influences his character. None of it. You'll forget he's in hockey for most of the book. The college angle doesn't exist in the story for either him or Thor. And his cooking ability is literally only there so Thor can moan sensually over his cooking whenever the author wants him to. So Cassian basically ends up being this hot boy for Thor to drool over and constantly cooks for Thor. You know, this... You know, <laughs> I'm not, uh, that, that's a bad joke. I'm not going to say that one. <laughs> Thor doesn't fare much better. He's supposed to be a shrinking violet type who's scared of his own shadow and has really bad social skills. Yet he helps break into a police station morgue with no reservations and interacts with more people than Cassian does at a casual level. His major of evolutionary biology is brought up more often than Cassian's law degree at least but only to further the point that his father is basically the worst kind of domineering parent, trying to force him down the path that his father wants, not what Thor wants. But in the end, it matters very little. You'll forget these two characters are even in college. Like, legitimately, I don't know why they're in college. 
it, it, this entire book could still work if you just took them both out of college. I even forgot that Thor gets a job as a scientific assistant halfway through, even though he works for the bad guy. And even his stated goal of using Cassian's rent money to move across country away from his family is pretty much forgotten about till near the end where he's like, Cassian, I'm not going to move away. I want to give you rent money back. As much as Thor's family, and, and that's another point, as much as Thor's family isn't great, sometimes you're just expected to think certain ways about them because the author's like, I need you to think this way about them. Like, the, the biggest example, like, okay, so the father, by far, is the worst. And that's done fairly well. You see how domineering and controlling he is. But I don't think you ever get the sense, I don't think the author ever truly conveyed the sense that the father genuinely sees Thor as, genuinely doesn't like love his son. It comes off like his father has a lot of high expectations for his son and doesn't realize the amount of pressure he's putting on his son when his son fails to live up to them. All culminating with the fact that his son doesn't get a shifter for him and in his mind being a shifter is one of the proudest, proudest traditions in the family. So he tries really hard to try to get his son a shifter for him, therefore, therefore seemingly creating an unintentional belief in Thor that his father thinks he's worthless. But I think this is by far done the worst during the Thanksgiving dinner scenes, where their personal chef calls in and Cassian offers to do the meal for them. It's very important to note that Cassian offers to do it, and Thor's mother, Freya, even tells him that it's fine, you don't need to do that, we'll order some pizza. And Cassian insists on cooking, because what's Thanksgiving without a turkey? And then as they lead Cassian into the kitchen to cook, Thor just angrily thinks to himself, how dare they treat my boyfriend like a servant? They want to do this for any of my siblings' dates. And it's like, he offered. It's not like he mentioned, oh yeah, I cook all the time. And the father was like, you know, our personal chef called in. Cassie, and you said you cooked. Come on, come cook Thanksgiving dinner for us. That That's, that's the scene that Strange's saying happened. But in reality, the scene is, hey, you guys want me to cook for you? Yeah, uh, are you sure you want to do that? We can just order something. No, 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 I would love to cook for you. How dare they make him cook for him? Also, this book has a mystery that you can solve within minutes of it being introduced. Okay, here's all I'm going to say. Just so you understand that when I spoil this, it's not much of a spoiler. The mystery is that Thor and Cassian keep finding the bodies of dead shifters who seem to have died halfway through a shift. But there's something off about these shifters. They look primitive, like they haven't developed. And I'm also going to tell you this. There's a character named Dr. Kendricks in this book who's working in a bioengineering lab and is trying to find a way to give shifter powers to non-shifters. Hmm. I wonder who the bad guy is. This is quite a shock. On the other hand, it's not surprising in the least. But what's worse is this whole mystery makes no sense. Okay, so, spoilers ahoy, but the baddie, Dr. Kendricks, is doing this because he used to date mom, he used to date Thor's mom, Freya. But he grew upset when Freya fell in love with her husband, Thor's father. I keep using Thor's father because I genuinely forgot this guy's name, so. I, I keep wanting to call him Ambrose, but that's Thor's last name if I remember right. But, uh, anyways, believing that only believing that the only reason that Freya fell in love with Thor's father over Dr. Kendricks is because the shift of form, Dr. Kendrick basically goes crazy and decides that meant he had to turn himself into a shifter to get her love back. Despite the fact they weren't even dating, but you know, that's at least fine in a way that it helps sell his insanity. Now ignoring the major problem that this is not in any way built up to a hint of that over the course of the book until it's revealed, thus the book not earning this twist in the slightest, the mystery of this book doesn't make sense. First off, why was Dr. Kendricks just throwing out the failed test subjects and not destroying them? The only reason anyone figured out what he was up to is because they found the dead bodies of his test subjects. Which again, for some reason, he literally just like, oh, that didn't work. Time to start again. Despite the fact, I just, I don't get it. Because what he was doing would bring major attention to him. 
anyone with half a brain should have realized, hey, half shifters keep popping up dead. And I happen to know a guy who's working on turning non-shifters into shifters. I wonder if the two are connected. Sorry, you have no idea how angry this, this, this made me while reading this book. Then there's the reveal that Lita was working for Kendricks the whole time, despite the fact she's been helping the heroes look into the murders. Except that doesn't make sense. She was drugged and had her genes stolen for the shifter experiment, the same as another character named Raf, and Thor was. But if she was involved the entire time, why did she need to be drugged? Secondly, she was helping our heroes with their investigations into the corpses, sneaking into the morgue with Thor to get samples. She's the one who suggested that idea, not Thor, by the way. And giving them explanations that was putting, like, neon signs over Kendrick's that our heroes somehow ignored. Something else she, wouldn't, she shouldn't have done if she was involved. And then finally, the author tries to hand wave this all by claiming that she's only helping Kendrick's because he threatened her family and then threatened her girlfriend, thus being forced into it. And yet, she would have started helping before she started dating Lucy. And her family is are people who can literally turn into animals and know people who can turn into a fucking bear. So why is this human threatening to her? And better yet, at the pivotal moment, where she literally has him unconscious on her anesthetic with a knife in her hand does absolutely nothing to stop him. She could literally just turn around and cut the wolf shifter that he has tied up behind her. And all she's got to do is step back. The problem's going to solve itself. And, and for all this hubbub for finding a proper, proper medical way to convert a shifter genes into a human body, Kendrick's ultimately just goes for the black magic route near the end. Sure, it's based off an old ritual that Thor discovered that was able to strip the fauna from a shifter, but there's no guarantee that it would transfer to a new person if that skin was, say, grafted onto a new person and that blood was transferred in. And even and even if you would argue that, oh yeah, well it makes sense that, you know, blood would transfer in, that's kinda like how they do passive vaccines, so obviously that could work. Okay, I understand that, but then why would he go through the other art parts of the ritual, such like burning sage? And then drawing a black circle around the operation table. Because that's totally scientific. Also, why did he... Why did he masturbate Thor? Serious question here. He kidnaps Leda and Ra, but as far as, he, as far as we know, he never molests them. And Thor, of all people, would be the worst one to do this to because Dr. Kendricks, as far as he knows, Thor can't shift into a shifter form. So the fact that he makes, he makes Thor put some gravy into a biscuit doesn't make sense other than to provide trauma for Thor to overcome. It's a 4 out of 10. <sighs> I just, like I said, I tried my hardest to go into this book and like it. And for the most part, at the beginning, it was okay. For the first hundred pages, I was like firmly at like a 6 out of 10. You know, one of those, it wasn't a great book, but at least it was interesting. It's enough to keep my attention. But the longer it went, the more and more this book frustrated me. Like, I'm not even having to play up my annoyance at this book during this review. I am genuinely this annoyed by this book. And it's like, there's good premises here. There's good premises here. It's just not handled in any way that's good. Also, it's it. Looking online, it's like one of those authors who, who's trying to put out stuff as fast as possible, like Colleen Hoover, or you know how I comment on the Ice Planet Barbarian, how she was putting out like five books a year. Th this came out in twenty twenty two, and has two sequels and a side story with it, and this book is 412 pages long. Oh, my bad. 427 pages long. The book doesn't even have satisfying conclusions for some of the character arcs. Like, the whole po like during this whole time where we're watching Thor be abused by his family, you're just waiting for that moment where he finally stands up to his family and either cuts them off or they learn to accept him for who he is. Only to not get that moment. The only time Thor properly stands up is he runs up and kicks his father while he's already down. The dude's already been defeated, and that's when Thor makes his big heroic moment. 
but because he's already been defeated, he doesn't feel heroic in that moment. It just feels like, ooh, here's a chance I can finally stand up without any consequences. Kick, 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 kick. <laughs> so in the end, when it comes to the question of whether or not it deserves Mount Doom, the answer is unfortunately, yes. I didn't throw that one as hard because the, the cover has not made it this strong stuff, so it would have bent. And even bad books, I don't like bending stuff unless like, it's really bad. This isn't like a uh, destroy this book kind of bad, although I, I don't really ever think that about it. But moving on. The point is, I really don't think I could recommend this book to anyone. I just, it, it's, it, the entire book is literally just an erotica pretending to be a romance story. If you want a real romance story, there's so many more I can point you to. Even ones that have sex scenes. It's just... It, read Red, Bright, and Royal Blue. It's it's a better fairy tale story, even. So, yeah, with that, that's all I really have to say about this book. Just remember that every book comes an adventure. And every adventure is worth having. Even the bad ones. See you later, everyone.